welcome to the latest edition of Ascending the Holy Mountain, a podcast brought to you by Holy Mountain Printing. They offer some of the best design, print rates, and quality around, so be sure to learn more at holymountainprinting.com. Also, we can't thank them enough, but our theme song was made by Slasher Film Festival Strategy. They make music for movies that simply do not exist, and to get the full copy of our theme song, as well as hear their full catalog, head over to slasherfilmfestivalstrategy.bandcamp.com. Today on the podcast, our host, Host Eric from the band Demon Eye, which you can learn more about at demoneyeofficial.com, interviews author Rizik of Summerlands. Summerlands self titled full album just came out on Relapse Records. Author is also a highly sought after producer who's done such records for the likes of Power Trip, Title Fight, and Inquisition. Find out more about him and Summerlands after the podcast at summerlands.bandcamp.com slash releases, and that's Summerlands with one M. Also at facebook.com slash Summerlands, also 1M. Be sure to click on the podcast show notes for links to click through to everything I've mentioned. All right, let's get into it. What's up, everybody? This is Eric from uh, Holy Mountain, and I'm excited to be talking to Mr. Arthur Rizik right now, who is a bit of a prolific musician these days. We are going to be talking to him about his current band, Summerlands, and their new record. And a lot of folks know Arthur for being a producer for bands like Power Trip, Title Fight, and uh, Prurient and Inquisition. And you've also played with uh, lots of other bands as well, right? You've uh, got... Yeah. Uh, yeah, you've got a background in uh noise and uh hardcore and uh now you're kind of tackling classic metal with this new record right yep that's uh, right excellent and you're in philadelphia right now is that correct yep cool. yep that's where i'm based out of excellent how's things in philly these days it's been quite some time since i've been there yeah it's uh pretty brutal <laughs> <laughs> it's uh Only way to put it i guess <laughs> at the time of this recording it is uh approaching mid december and it's uh it's damn cold here in North Carolina so I can imagine it's uh cut oh I can't imagine yeah it's pretty frost bitten there I would imagine though <laughs> yeah big time that's cool man and uh you were born and raised Pennsylvania guy right yeah, I, I came from a, about an hour north of Philadelphia from a place called like Easton, and that's uh, in the in the Lehigh Valley where Allentown, Pennsylvania, is. Right. Uh, that's where where the noise uh, scene basically stuff came from. Is uh, in Allentown has a really sick noise scene. Well, not not so much anymore, but you know, early OOS. And that's where the band uh, Pissed Jeans is based out of as well, right? Yeah. It was another band that and you I, recorded. Yep, I just uh, got done a few months back with their LP, uh, Why Love Now, for Sub Pop. It's uh, pretty sick, too, and I've, I've always liked those guys. I've been I've known them for a really long time, but their bass player, actually, Randy, was one of my uh, guitar heroes when I was younger. He has a band called Pearls and Brass, and they're at like actually insane uh, really, really good, like, uh, I guess you could call it just, like, classic uh, rock or stone or metal or whatever. I, I know Pearls and Brass, and I'd never put that connection together. That is incredible. Yeah, it's funny because he's under he's underused in Piss Jeans. He's a, he's a bass player, but uh, not not to take away from Piss Jeans guitarist Brad, who's a dear friend of mine and, and really stick to that's, that's But we had a great... Good. I was gonna say that's just impre- pretty incredible for me to know because I love both those bands and they're you know they're quite yeah. you know it's it's not um, too terribly unheard of to like be a fan of both those styles but they are quite different. Um, that's yeah, they have like a circle of of uh, bands that kind of like I wouldn't say spun off each other but they're all like uh, with the same guys that came from like Na- like Nazareth Allentown area um, and what and the, this. That guy Don Gibson too was is like in, was in Pearls and Brass and um, yeah they're it, they're just like fucking sick. All those guys are are diehard musicians. That is some great musicianship coming from that neck of the woods. Then that's great. 
Yeah. And I guess it's not, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I always find it really interesting when I see these kind of like shared tastes between uh, the classic rock sound or classic metal sound and also just kind of like yeah. being experimental and being, you know, doing the type of music that's got a lot of aggression to it. Like you yourself have a background in noise, as we were just saying, and yeah. uh, in black metal as well. And uh, uh-huh. yeah. Yeah, um, I assume like a lot of other young guys, it was sort of classic rock. Was your um, was that sort of your gateway into music, or did you kind of start with the yeah. aggressive stuff? I, I mean, I I started really young, listening to to being obsessed with music. I mean, my dad was into like uh, Rod Stewart and the Bee Gees, and I still love the Bee Gees and uh, um, stuff like that, and my older cousins got me into heavy metal when I was probably like seven or eight years old. Uh, they they got me into early Metallica, which was to me back then was like that didn't even sound like music; it sounded like noise, uh, right? Thrash metal, uh, Megadeth, like Pantera, um, all that's like the you know the the basic stuff like uh, Death and all that stuff. So. All, all that early stuff that I was getting into was was really the young age, and um, I knew that that's that's the kind of stuff that I wanted to like play. I wanted to play on drums, but I I really wasn't a good drummer. Um, and then I ended up just picking up the guitar. And I think a lot of kids who start playing guitar they they have to start with classic stuff, like uh, because you just I mean if you're starting young. You you pick up like ACDT, Scorpions, fucking Led Zeppelin, all that shit, and um, and then you go your whatever your your separate way. Like uh, I obviously started getting into like death metal pretty young, and was really really into Chuck Schuldner. He's a fucking insane guitar player, and uh, went that route. And, I, and even Chuck, he applies lots of classic metal stuff to death. He had, he had his band Control Denied that was absolutely amazing. And uh, he was a big fan of like Warlord and, and all that classic metal, like all that stuff from 80s Metal Blade era, early stuff, the power metal shit. And it, it came through with the, with the death stuff. And I think maybe that's how I ended up coming full circle to me now 29 years old doing Summerlands and my, my other band Eternal Champion and uh, I think that like you know after going not I wouldn't call them phases but after re- you know really getting into death metal as a teen and really getting into black metal as like a later teen and, and noise as a teen and then you know finally growing growing to this age I came back around to like classic heavy metal. Um, and actually a story that I think I've told before, but I was going to Japan and had gotten an iPod stolen from me at a show I was doing sound for a clutch show, actually. And, uh, somebody stole the iPod because there were like, like 3000 people in a, in a, like a, 2000 capacity room and I couldn't get to my iPod. So someone gave me a free iPod and I was leaving for Japan the next day and was in my parents' house. It was close to the airport and I only had my early like metal CDs to put on the iPod and that's kind of how I got back into it to the groove of things. Wow, that's Listen, that's, like that's pretty interesting. Iron Maiden, yeah, Iron Maiden, Fate's Warning, uh Running Wild, all, all that stuff. That's kind of a cool. It's very haphazard and very, uh, very much a reminder of what got you into everything, huh? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. It, I see this pattern a lot with musicians and sort of with myself as well. Where you, you know, you have those riffing one hundred and one bands, like you were saying, like ACDC and your staples yeah. like that. And then you discovered Metallica. And then you just kind of wanted something that was more intense and abrasive, and the noise yeah. and extreme. Yeah, everyone metal. goes through it. Absolutely. And then, of course, you know, you never really stopped loving the, the classic stuff that you got into. Yeah, no. Nah. Yeah, it's, it's really, really a, a interesting thing to because I, I was never, I never considered myself a great songwriter, but then I uh, figured that, like, through years of practice, figured out how to write songs and figured out how to structure songs. And, and the, just by being obsessed with music, I, I, 
all these ideas. It wasn't until recently, within the last few years, that I found myself like actually applying all the shit that I learned and making uh, songs that I was actually really psyched about. Um, so it's just one of those things. I can certainly identify with that. I, I myself kind of play with a more classic type band. Uh, we're called Demon Eye. And um, I was really excited when I found out I was doing this interview with you guys because uh, a big influence on my songwriting when I started this band was Hour of 13. And, you, of course, you have uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah, Phil Swanson as the lead singer for Summerlands. Yep. That is amazing. How did you yeah, guys... Yeah, well, then I'll have to check out your band then. But um, so I, I actually... I, go ahead, ask a question. I was just going to ask how you and Phil first met. Uh, I was playing me and me and Jason Tarby. Jason Tarby is the singer of my other band, Eternal Champion. Uh, we were we were playing in a band years ago called Iron Age, and we were on tour. And we uh, were in like Connecticut or something, and we were listening to Hour Thirteen all the time on the tour. We we're both super into it. It's like uh, I think it was right before the Ritualist came out. Um, and somebody gave us on the tour, someone who was in Night Bitch, we stayed with him and he gave us Phil's contact info uh, just because we were like talking about how obsessed we were with, with our 13. And we just, Jason became friends with Phil and then Phil needed random like drummer and bassist for uh, our 13 to do some live shows and we were, we were like, okay, fuck yeah, let's do it. So he asked us, he asked Jason, Jason asked me, we did, uh, we started learning everything, we learned everything, and then we did a music video with our 13. We never played a show, we never, like, did anything, we just started in that music video, and then our 13 broke up, like, uh, um, like a couple months later or something, so. Okay, this is blowing my uh, mind, man. Right. Were, were you guys the ones in the video for Who's to Blame? Yep, that's me on drums. Oh, no way. And Jason <laughs> Tarpey, the singer of Eternal Champions, the bassist. Wow, that is incredible. Yeah, I guess I just always thought of you as a guitar player, so I didn't think to look closely to see you there on the drum kit. That's that's amazing. Well, yeah, I, I've, I get like one text every like six months that's like, dude, are you in an hour 13 video? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always, it's, it just trickles in. Oh, that is so cool. So. Well, that, yeah, it's such a great band. And, I, you know, I always love the songwriting, love the vibe of oh, just what too. they were going for. And, and Phil just has such a killer voice. He sounded excellent yeah. on, on you guys' record, too. Yeah, and he's he's also an uh, insane um, lyricist and placing placing the vocals in the right place. Um, he's just like, he's got it all and it makes it easy for me. Like that's how I, that's how I was able to do summer ones. It wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Phil. Like I was writing demos and I would send it to him and then I wouldn't, I didn't know what to expect. I actually never really done, done it that way where it would be, okay, here's a song for you. Uh, do whatever you want. And so I was, I sent him the guardian was the first song we did and he sent it back maybe less than 24 hours later done exactly how you hear it on the record pretty much and i was like what the fuck is up with this guy he's insane he's just railing these some of these lyrics down and just doing everything perfect it is really so. interesting that you brought that song up in particular because that was one of the songs i wanted to talk to you about you know it's i of yeah. course mainly know phil from hour of 13 and love to sing it mm -hmm. there but I really think he took it to the next level with that that song in particular. It's got this real kind of merciful fate type vibe to it, and yeah. uh, you know, it's just with the intensity of the that the, the sort of high vocals that he hits, kind of in that King Diamond. Yeah, the, range. Fal the falsetto. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I love that. I remember getting the the tracks back, and just like I said, just being blown away. And I I love the falsetto stuff. Like I said, from my early ages, I was super into the Bee Gees, and I would I would always like laugh, like how the hell are these guys sounding like these like chipmunks or whatever? But then, you know, my that's how I got into King Diamond. My cousins were like, "Yo, you you like that? That's falsetto." You should check out this guy, King Diamond. He's he's crazy. Absolutely, it's funny, you know, thinking yeah. back and being a young guy and hearing people sing like that. It, it kind of like. I can remember some folks instantly liked it. For myself, I it took me a little while to kind of warm up to it. You know, it was like it. I kind of had to like get weirded out by it, and then, and then realize, holy shit, I this is it was awesome! Crazy, yeah. 
I was just like, whoa, this really just really hit me with a high, and I was like, what the fuck, man, that's crazy. Definitely. And for the record, I'm down with the Bee Gees as well. I think they're a great band. All yeah. eras of them, all eras of them. I'm talking disco and like that kind of Beatles sounding era they had as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, the early shit. Definitely, definitely. Another uh, song that I really particularly liked on you guys' album is Haunted Forever. And um, I, I really liked just how that kind of like had this eerie effect and then it segues, I can't re- recall the title, but the song it goes directly into really kind of like kicks it into overdrive uh, a bit. Spiral, Spiral Infinity, it's like the the faster song of the yes, record. Yes, yes, yeah, that's a great transition. Um, you know, just a lot of good stuff going on there. And I've heard you mention in other interviews before that Queensryche and... Um, we had mentioned Fate's Warning a little bit ago. What are some other yeah. bands that kind of like inspired the sound for that album? Overall, like, like Fate's Warning and Queensryche are the are the big ones. Uh, you don't hear a lot of Fate's Warning on the record uh, influence, but it was it was a really big thing for me. But also, um, <clears throat> I would say a lot of the best way to put it would be a lot of unknown U.S. power metal. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, a lot of unknown U.S. power metal uh, in the 80s were they were, a lot of bands would just put out one record and drop off the face of the earth. Right. Uh, and there's, there's like thousands and thousands of them. And I would just listen to all this stuff. And it was like uh, a continuation of Queensryche's first EP, like... Uh, there's some bigger ones like Warlord is like they they went on they did did a million things um Warlord uh this band Lethal is really really good um they're a metal blade band they had a re- record called Program that was really sick um out of the bigger bands you you could you could hear some Dokken in there for sure like I'm a big George Lynch fan a big Dokken fan uh, I'm a huge Iron Maiden fan. Iron Maiden had some influence in there too. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, if, as I think song through song, you can think like I'm more influenced by like guitar players than bands. Like, really influenced by by obviously Jakey Lee is a is a big one from Ozzy. But oh, absolutely. N- not not to. Also, like not to you know, Randy Rhodes, not to be limited, but Randy Rhodes and Tony Iommi, and just like everybody, like all the big guitar players, that's what influenced the record. It's a guitar-driven record. Absolutely, you know, everything yeah. else on the record kicks ass, but uh, the the guitars are are what's pretty much driving, you know, the melodies and the music. Yeah, the guy who plays guitar for my band is a huge, huge fan of that era that we're talking about, like Randy Rhodes and yeah. Jakey Lee are two of his favorites. Oh, and yeah. I actually told him earlier that I was going to be interviewing you, and I was like, you got to hear Summerland's record if you had and, <laughs> and he was like, oh, nice. I'm, I'm already all over it. So. <laughs> hell yeah, hell yeah. yeah. Well, that's another thing. I want you, I, I just like, that's my biggest thing is I want people to check it out who are into that kind of music because... I don't really don't really give a shit what happens with a band, what kind of hype we get, what lists we make, how much we sell. I just want like old motherfuckers who don't know that music like this still exists to have something new to listen to. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah so. there, there are some you know good bands out there that are kind of like doing the good throwback thing. You know, whether it's uh, you know something yeah. you guys are doing. Um, Black Trip from Sweden is another one that comes to mind, you know, and other guys who kind yeah. of are known for some extreme metal but can kind of throw down some good old yeah. school melodic kind of driving yeah. stuff too. Yeah. I just, I'm just i very happy to see just how interchangeable that is these days. You know, you can have guys yeah. kind of on all sides of the spectrum. And I think uh, people in the, in the black metal scene are really, really into classic heavy metal. A lot of them are. Uh, all the guys that I've met in in the Europe, like I've toured with Abbott, Abbott himself is like a giant, uh, classic metal fan. Like, um, all the, like the dark thrones, all those dudes, like everybody that, that the black metal scene is super into classic heavy metal. And I'm not sure why, but I think it's just cause like the European, uh, the, like Europeans really, really loved heavy metal a lot. Like that era, the era that we speak of is, is the most popular shit. Like later Sabbath people in America don't, don't fucking really get down with somebody. And somebody's even gone to the lengths of like calling me a hipster for being into 
like later era Sabbath or it's just not it's not true. It's like would this have anything cool. to do with the metal sucks article you wrote about the your Sabbath playlist or <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> just out yeah, of curiosity. Yeah. That was <laughs> that's that's where I read the comment. Yeah. I uh <laughs> I don't I don't I don't read a lot of comments but I was re- I was like uh, really psyched about the playlist. So, oh, I thought it was I, great. I, you know, for a Sabbath yeah. fan myself who appreciates all the different eras, you know, I thought you did a good job of like, you know, Thank you yeah. obviously weren't going in there going, okay, I'm not going to put the stuff in there that I'm trying to impress people with like the yeah. obscure selections, you know, and you know, there was, nah. you know, you, it was good, it was good, you know, and I like that a playlist of jam. Yeah, and you could tell that you know the music well too. Like when you chose the song fluff you you know really i really like how you got into the orchestration aspect of it you know yeah. just, that took oh, a lot of imagination and so talent. Pretty, i think black sabbath like tony iomi was a fucking genius and uh they they just did so much stuff that flew under the radar completely um and i see and as years go on i see stuff as as a producer like the guy that produced their um 1992 record dehumanizer where uh it was dio's come back into the band uh the guy who produced his name was reinhold mack and he was like an insane uh producer from germany that did like queen and donna summer and all this insane shit um and he revolutionized all this stuff and people don't really listen to dehumanizer the sound on that record is bigger and harder than any sabbath record that that exists with Ozzy, you know, and that's a controversial statement, but I'm just talking specifically this, like the sound and the production is huge. Yeah, it definitely is a, a different sounding record than like the Sabbath albums that most people are used to. And and it's, you know, it's yeah. interesting that you're hearing it through like the producer's ear as well. You know, it's a, it's yeah. a whole side of the craft that you're, you're in on there. <laughs> I got to ask, since uh, we're on the subject of, uh, under the radar Sabbath or however you want to refer to it. What are your thoughts on the born again album? Oh, I love it. I, mean, I love uh, it too. Yeah. Love, yeah. It's a great record. I always yeah. love talking to Sabbath fans oh. about that one. It's really, <laughs> I can remember like when I was a kid um, or not a kid, but like, you know, a teenager, I, for some reason I just never really came across that one. And then I can remember hearing the cannibal corpse cover of zero, the hero, <laughs> and then had to go hear the, well, the, the Sabbath original. And I was like, is that the guy from deep purple singing? Oh my God. You know, it just yeah, it, it yeah. rewrote history for me, even though it's oh, kind I, of. <laughs> I also love deep purple too. Deep purple's an amazing band. Um, they had a great, comeback record as well called uh perfect strangers and oh, i think yeah. it might be it, i mean like that's like that might be i don't know if it's my favorite deep purple record but I, I i fuck with it all the time like perfect strangers is like the, the best song i want it to be like played as my caskets being lowered into the grave <laughs> that'd be a good yeah. sign off to life for sure yeah yeah deep purple is uh, one of my favorites as well and you know that yeah, album of course, Blackmore. oh yeah yeah i think anyone who's into music in general just can appreciate him you can hear some richie black blackmore uh influence on this on Rollins record too as well i mean yeah his, definitely his his uh lead style is is really cool and i love the neoclassical aspect i love i love malmstein too like the the neoclassical stuff he was super into blackmore as well definitely you would have such a good time talking to larry our guitar player i swear (laughs) (laughs) we'll have to link up yeah yeah definitely man definitely and uh you know it, it looks like a lot of the bands you've been working with lately too are kind of crossover metal acts as well and um you know, of course, that was like a big thing in the 80s as, you know, I'm probably got a good yeah. 10 or 11 years on you. But back then, you know, there was like that. Uh, mm-hmm. It's OK to be a hardcore fan and a metal fan as well. And you started seeing the bands yeah. like DRI and, and my buddies yeah. here in Raleigh, Corrosion of Conformity, of course, kind of like, you know, yeah, blending that I kind like of thing. Those, those bands are great. I, when it came, comes to the crossover era stuff. Uh, I think I prefer some of the hardcore crossover over the metal crossover stuff. Right. Um, and that's how I got, I mean, that's, there's a record, uh, Lee, have you heard Leeway? Uh, they're, uh, they're a hardcore crossover band. There's a record they have called Desperate Measures that actually bridged the gap for me between metal and hardcore and probably changed my life, uh, insanely, like, I, I don't know what it was, but they, it's kind of like, it's kind of like urban sounding. It's a little bit rap, like rap 
even, you know, but it's, it's just like an insane crossover record that made me realize what hardcore was to people and what metal, like how metal people heard hardcore and how hardcore people hear metal. And it just bridged the gap completely for me. It's like the best hardcore record that and, uh, Crow Mag's, uh, best wishes, which yeah. is their, their second record. And the only record I really even listened to them. I've never, I don't even think I've ever heard their first record the whole way through their age of coral or whatever. That's excellent. Yeah. Definitely a classic band there. Yeah. That's great, man. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of the hardcore and it's kind of like more extreme side of metal is kind of equated to emotions like, you know, anger, violence, you know, just overall aggression where, yeah. Classic metal kind of, you know, of, of course, a lot of it is like sort of fan, fantasy based in terms of the lyrical content and the imagery. But mm-hmm. it's also kind of associated, in my opinion, with like just kind of fun, rollicking, good times, you know, the, yeah. the classic rock and roll experience. Um, do yep. you ever do you ever feel like you've got like a schizophrenic personality between uh, your musical projects and, and those emotions? Or do you does that sort of thing not really matter to you too much? Um, I don't know exactly how to answer that question to be honest i think that i've been i you know i don't i don't write the lyrics for summerlands the lyrics are actually really uh they're kind of depressing i mean he's he's basically going through the worst depression of his life and he's overcoming it and falling back into it while he's while we're doing this album this and it's just you're, like you're talking about yeah, yeah i mean okay. it's Sorry like to hear that. it's you know, I mean, not, not, he's dude, he's awesome. He's great. He's not like you know, it, he's not like a, on the edge or anything. But I mean, he's just been he was going through some like dark shit. He's writing some really great stuff. He was coming out of it, and it's you know, he was really living that stuff. And I was writing you know, dark guitar stuff. I'm not I'm not the most chipper person. I mean, I think you go through every member of Summerlin's. We're all like. Uh, pretty much the the five most, you know, miserable, grumpy people in the world <laughs> that you can put together in a band, and uh, it's just really funny that uh, we we found each other in that in that sense. But um, in hardcore, a lot of, there really is a lot of anger and aggression, and, it, and a lot of it's like political motivated. A lot of it's situational uh, motivated, and uh, you know, that stuff is, is real. And I, you know, all those things that I've ever done, I've really felt it's never been like, uh, I need to get into a, I need to get into this mind state to write a song. It's just something happens. Like even with the noise projects, the black metal stuff, that's all happened, uh, in, in time, you know, just got to come naturally. The mindset. I can't, yeah. yeah, I can't like sit in the chair and be like, all right, now what, what, uh, scale is gonna gonna emote some depressive you know hard 80s hard rock you know right, it's like right. it's not like that and uh, i don't really party that much i i like to sit and stare at the wall in my bedroom more than anything it's my number <laughs> one favorite thing to do that's another so. thing i can uh, i can definitely identify with <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, hate to interrupt, but I gotta tell you about some other shows on our podcast network. Mondays is Netflix, a show hosted by me and John, where we watch movies on Netflix and get back to you. We tell you if they're good, bad, what now, or hidden gems. We do the dirty work so you don't have to. Tuesdays, All Things Popped, hosted by me and Mikey. We talk science and technology and tell you all the things you never knew you never needed to know. Wednesdays, LC Does Your Scene, hosted by Rick Aggie. He talks to local bands and gets the scoop on what they're up to. Thursdays, back to All things popped with me and mikey with more science and technology friday ascending the holy mountain a show brought to you by holy mountain printing they talk to the guys they've gotten to know over the years in the movie and music industry and finally saturday is i'll have what he's having a show hosted by sean and alex they drink new and old favorite beverages and let you know what's good or not all this can be found at lastchancepodcastnetwork.com and while you're over there scroll to the bottom Sign up for our newsletter, and we'll keep you in the know of all of our happenings. All right, let's get back to it. (laughs) 
That's cool, man. You know, it's 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 good that you know you you're obviously the kind of guy who has a lot of talents with not only your production work but like with these different musical styles. It's like you just seem like you've got many outlets for like wherever your mind or your your state of being is taking you. Yeah, I'm just I just you know hone it in when the time is right, basically. So I mean, I've, I've been working my ass off on a, a lot of different stuff, and uh, I I got um. Where I literally came from the studio to home to to talk to you, and I was working on something for my other band, Eternal Champion. I'm recording drums for it right now, and I'll be doing like a hardcore uh, record tomorrow through the next two weeks. So, um, yeah, I'm constantly doing different stuff. That's cool. Uh, so, so it's noise, good. like yeah, do some noise stuff. Doing like a project for a, a dude who's who's trying to do some like dead can dance type type thing. And, oh, that sounds cool. Yeah. You know, it's just, it is always like constantly like changing. It's just because I'm into so many different things and, uh, <laughs> it's just, you know, to stay, to stay on my toes. I'm constantly accepting different weird shit to record. You know, I don't, um, stick with one genre or like play one genre and these things, just all the different things that I'm into. So it's basically just a non-issue for you to kind of like, uh, you know, switch it from switch genres or switch styles, like whether it's you playing it or what you're recording. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Do you have any particular type of style that you like to produce? Like you mentioned the the dead can dance style band that you're doing, you know, is it just, Oh, it's, it's, it's uh, it was not, it's not my band. It's just a, a thing that I was that I'm producing. But um, the yeah, like all of the stuff that I'm into. That uh, the, my favorite stuff to produce. <sighs> it's tough, but I love I because I, I really just have fun doing the actual, the act of producing like that. Doing it with a band that I like is just so much fun to be involved with the process. You don't have to be. Um, you don't have to be in the band after it's over. You're in the band for like a couple weeks and then you never have to deal with those fuckers again. It's like, <laughs> okay, it's like, that's it. Like we, we made a record together. You get all the like, the like fucking like, oh, we were down in the muck. We made it. We made these songs. We, you know, but I, I do like, I do like, um, I do like working in really nice studios. I, I have a studio that I, that working in Philadelphia called Creep Records that uh, me and my girlfriend Jackie just spent the whole day uh, renovating one of the rooms. But uh, it's 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 like it's a nice it's a good enough you know place. But I got to record in like London Bridge Studio in Seattle where Alice in Chains Dirt was recorded and like uh, like Pearl Jam Ten and Soundgarden all this stuff and I got to record the Inquisition record there which is like insane. Nice. So I, I had a lot of fun doing that. I had uh, two engineers working around the clock with me, so I was kind of just sitting in a chair and, you know, kind of barking out orders, like two uh, fucking uh, interns that were working <laughs> there, too, like going on, like, weed runs, doing whatever you want, like, buying, like, getting you your lunch, doing whatever, so the that classic, was cool. I, uh, I, do, I do enjoy that kind of thing as well. That's but, great, man. The classic um, executive producer credit that you used to see on yeah. albums all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's really good. It's a good time. Excellent. But, yeah, metal music is, is really the, is the, probably the, the thing that I have, the most fun doing when it comes to producing, but I, I really do enjoy listening to a lot of, uh, like, uh, classic, you know, AOR rock stuff like Fleetwood Mac and all that kind of, you know, good shit, the Eagles. And I never, haven't really got to come across the closest thing of doing a record like that was probably just jeans, just being able to do, uh, like 12 songs or whatever and individually focus on each song and uh you know keep bring different amps for every song and different you know room sounds or whatever it's just you know that that's, was a lot of fun that's cool they gave you a chance to kind of experiment and layer and yeah. that sort of thing 
And we were also using like the heavy metal pedal. I mean, Brad's probably going to be pissed that I left the secret, but we had the, <laughs> the heavy metal pedal going using like some like, I don't know, like a, the a boss strat heavy or metal pedal yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, going into like a, like a Fender combo for like a song that's, that's just a straight up like, you know, punk song. So it's, oh, it's a very Fender Stratocaster cool. through a heavy metal pedal and a, and a Fender amp. I like, imagine that's a yeah, pretty, yeah. Like I would imagine that's it's a gnarly good, sound. Yeah, that'd be a good tone for pissed jeans as well. That's that's the yeah. band you're talking yeah. about with this, yeah. this sound. Okay, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, you know, yeah. like the classic punk bands always kind of had the uh, you know that abrasive guitar sound. You know, I think of like uh, yeah. you know the old Black Flag records and Greg Ginn's just uh, God. He had such a raunchy guitar tone. Yeah, and it's it's funny. You know, Definitely. it's like. I know guys that are into hardcore who just like, you know, gag over the thought of like, you know, people guitar <laughs> over their, their tones and things like that. And like, oh, shut up, poser. Well, but it's like, you definitely know. Definitely in, in hardcore, there's like a standard, like, I call it the pro core setup. And it's like, uh, either like a, it's like a, probably like a Gibson if you can afford it. If not, like, something else, like a, I don't know, like a shit shifter or something. Like, a, 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 one of, like a, a decent guitar into a fifty one fifty head with like no nope, nothing. That's it. That's like the thing. It's that's the hardcore sound. It's like the pro core sound and it's very, very tired and it's it's pretty weak. So I like that that term for that pro core. <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome, man. Right on. You know, there's one thing I wanted to ask you about. It was something I read in an interview with you, um, probably the Vice interview you did a few years ago. You threw a cinder block into a crowd once during a performance. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It was, um, it was a, it was, uh, it's Chaos and Chaos 2012. And that was a show. I think I was playing a show with a band from, um, who was it? Who, I don't even remember who was playing the show. It was Bl- uh, Black Witchery and more Bossa Dodd and my my uh, pro- my like black metal noise project at the time. And yeah, I just I got I got like uh, basically blacked out and was just doing all kinds of insane shit. But that that's uh that's what it is about. It is more of a a true you know violent band that was something real and wasn't for show. And I mean, I got the cinder blocks thrown right the fuck back at me. It, it missed my head by maybe six inches <laughs> and, and went through like more boss dots drum set. and just like, it basically exploded the drum set. Like, <laughs> and, uh, I also had like, uh, so like glass vases full of baby powder, like throwing them into the crowd. And those were, that was pretty crazy. People are just like, why the fuck even dude? Like, I'm surprised I didn't get my ass whooped, but I didn't. And, uh, it was just, you know, it's definitely a memorable, memorable thing. And, um, that project was, was on hospital records called, it was called terrorism, but I don't, I don't really do that anymore. I can't wait. I can't top the last thing that I did. I'd have to like, run myself over with a lawnmower or something. <laughs> I doubt anybody would be questioning your authenticity, not only after the cinder block gig, but, uh, you know, the, definitely bringing lawnmowers into the pictures as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, pretty, uh, yeah, it was a pretty insane shit, but, uh, I re- I really love, um, I really have always been like a, a fan of noise and, uh, it comes from, like I said, back to the beginning of the interview in Allentown, there's a place called Jeff the Pigeon that would have like insane shows of people doing crazy shit. Uh, this one guy Costas from France is like literally shitting in their room and like had like a, had like a lady with him that was, uh, basically nude with, with a tampon in her vagina. And, like he had a toilet there with a dildo on his head and doing all this crazy shit. And like, I remember watching this guy just being like full on scared, be like, what the fuck is about to happen? Am I going to get like, like smacked with a dildo or something? <laughs> so this was their live like, performance when they were doing this. Yeah. This was in a warehouse, like, uh, in Allentown. Um, it's like, 
basically it was like a like a sweatshop sewing factory, and they had a a tiny room that these guys and they rented. The Pitch Jeans have played there before too, uh, and like uh, Pearls and Brass and like a ton of bands, Purian. So like it was a, it was a it was a world destination for noise. Yeah, I was gonna say this sounds like well, just what you described sounds like pretty intense into some GG Allied yeah. territory. So I could imagine. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's, I like that when you talk to people who are all kind of like from a, a little area that's had a lot of artistic output and created a lot of great bands. It's it, there's always that venue or that scene or that community that is going to be the thing that people are talking about thirty years on. And it sounds like you got a lifetime of memories if that's the kind of thing you witness there. You know, and that's oh a, yeah, that's just, the kind of thing just from to... like. Just from like age thirteen to like nineteen, it was like five years of like madness. Every show that was there was like crazy. Is there any remnants of the scene uh, still happening in that area, or do you guys? All no, just, yeah. not really. Gotcha. gotcha. Not, not really. I mean, they have, they there's still something going on there, but nothing like uh, not like um, the not the insane like basically all noise all like harsh shit crazy shit like back then people were coming from all over the world to just to play in that room and in allentown just weird so gotcha man did you think it when you were witnessing a guy defecate on stage in this uh, little sweatshop warehouse in allentown <laughs> that you yeah, the uh, you know the reputable producer and prolific musician that you are now were you just just a kid having fun at the time or did you have your sights set to uh, you know what you were doing could take you into the future you know then i um i didn't know what i wanted to do i went to college i went to community college and uh didn't really have anything going for me but i knew i wanted to record my own music so i did that i started taking some classes and i think just learning like learning enough to know how a record is kind of made maybe look at all of my music completely differently. Like even to this day, there's records that I've shut down when I was uh, a little bit younger and a little bit snobbier that I go back to and check out. And it's like, I grew like a third year that I'm hearing these things completely different. Also reading, um, reading like tape off magazine back in the day really got me into producing, hearing like stories of just many you know, producers who, you know, they, I don't know, you know, they just tell stories about how they got sounds, they, how they got great performances out of artists. And it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily even have to be someone that I, that I really like. It's just interesting to hear. Yeah. And, uh, once you start learning about how to place things in a mix and you realize it's, it's really not, it's really all about like, how the band does and how the band performs and what their ideas are, what their psychology is and how they're feeling, what's the temperature of the room. You really realize that there's so fucking much that goes into producing that it's really more of an art than, than actually performing the songs. It's, it's more of an art getting the take and getting, you know, getting the band to do the best they can. Um, and helping them out. So I really just, that, that happened probably like I grew that third year, probably when I was like 19 or 20. Um, Kate, uh, Kate Bush, which is like, uh, uh, you, you know, Kate Bush, is yes. probably, uh, yeah. Kate Bush's hounds of love record was an, a, something that really got me into producing too. hearing that. Um, I think I, I noticed that there was no symbol sounds anywhere on the record. Like there's, not one symbol on that whole record. And I just couldn't like for the life of me figure out how the hell they came up with that. Like, how do you make a record without one symbol? And it's all like pop and it's all like, uh, you know, upbeat stuff. It's just crazy. So that's great, man. You definitely developed an ear for that kind of thing. Then I can remember yeah, just over the years. Yeah. There was, I think it was about 15 years ago. I got to meet uh, Steve Albini in his studio in Chicago. And, um, awesome. he's, uh, yeah, you've probably, I would imagine in your line of uh, work and in your circle, you've probably crossed paths with them before, but, um, you know, just seeing his studio and just seeing how meticulous he was with how he got his sounds. Like he was showing us the 
style of brick that he had that uh, he had shipped <laughs> from New Mexico because like it got a good, p- particular base response and then like he I remember he had this the best way I could describe it was like a great if a grain silo that you see in the Midwest or on a farm was made out of glass <laughs> oh, like he had his shit. drums in that so it, it I really like that like a lot of uh, producers who get really into what they do have like that one story of like that really bizarre technique that they use what would you say was your most um unusual recording technique or recording experience. Do you, do you have one? I actually had some uh, dirt flown in from uh, Papua New Guinea to that era. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, no, I, I, I do have a lot of unconventional techniques because I, I, I don't think I'm a very good engineer to be honest with you. Like I, uh, I've, I've worked very hard at getting to where I'm at because when I went to college, I, I, I did learn a couple of things, but I really, I really sucked, uh, at school at that time too. So now when it's, once I kind of had a couple of years of experience and hands on, I've gone back and reread everything there is to know about engineering. And now I have like kind of two different, two different perspectives. The perspective I had, before when I didn't know what I was doing versus now that I do know for the most part what I'm doing, I have, um, a very like abstract way of going about recording, but I'd say my, my weirdest, uh, thing that I was, that I've done, I'm trying to think there's definitely a lot of, um, I mean, there's definitely been a lot of, uh, experimentation with, with micro, with microphones, like, putting microphones in in like different different rooms and putting them through guitar amps and like doing you know god knows what i'm just trying to think of something specific yeah um, I, I i get you you know I, that, that could be a bizarre feeling like when it's almost a disconnect between where the uh, console is and where your musicians yeah. are you know with that whole distant micing yeah. thing so yeah like no, like noise too like when when you do noise you have like 15 pedals or whatever and you you you're trying to make something sound like something out of nothing um I, i've found that using a lot of like poor like old gear from the from the 90s and 80s stuff that's just like literally 15 dollars used that nobody would ever want finding that stuff and putting it through high quality gear like preamps and shit like that and, and finding your sounds is really uh how you can kind of get sounds that don't that don't sound just like a pro core like we were saying before you know what i mean like <laughs> so core, yeah. so it, it, we have we have like a you know you get like a, a lot of studios can have like a generic like metal sound like a plug into the Mesa and this is a sign you're going to get plug into your 800. This is how you get, you can really go crazy and do whatever the fuck you want with like, by just patching in old, old shit into a combo amp and then mixing those two things together. Like using like your combo amp with like, you know, your, your rack mount, whatever blind six pod from like the the (laughs) nineties or whatever, like that's like horrible sampling quality or like whatever mix all that stuff with a really nice, you know, Bogner head or whatever. Right. And you have, you have your unique tone. You don't have a, a standard fucking, you know, bland tone that, that people like compressed guitar or whatever that people get all the time. Gotcha, gotcha. I'm all about that. That's cool. You definitely seem like you know how to get your sounds, you know, and judging from the uh, the resume of bands you've worked with, it seems like, uh, you know, they would all agree, you know. You can, I don't, Maybe. I, I don't think I you're going to be I out don't of, know about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it doesn't seem like you'll be out of work as an engineer or producer anytime soon, so that's oh, great. Oh, man, you just cursed me. You just <laughs> jinxed me. But I think, um, yeah, I think that the, the most important thing about if I could sum all of my like uh, rant, ranting into one thing, I think the most important thing would be not is just having a drive and not giving up. A lot of people will find a sound and they 
they'll be satisfied with it, but they, you know, they don't really love it. Find something that you love. Find something that's different. Find your tone. Find something that is unique. Don't just go with, you know, plug into this and turn plug into the, you know, the the fucking Soldano and turn it on or plug into the whatever. Right, but right. GCM 2000, you just got to try, keep going, have the drive because, I mean, I worked on a Summer Ones record for a really long time for months with the guitars. I have six layers of guitars and each layer is, is a different setup, so... And you are happy with the end result, I would imagine. Oh yeah, Excellent. very psyched. And this band doesn't plan on um, performing live too terribly often. Is, is, am I right about that, or have you guys discussed that option? Terribly often would be the right the right thing to say. Yeah, but we're definitely going to play more live. We played our first show in October and in New York, and it turned out awesome. And we talked about it, so we would just do some more stuff. Just kind so, of yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. It, it, yeah. I mean, we weren't going to, at first, we were probably just going to do that show and just call it quits, like, as far as doing shows is concerned. But uh, we had a really good time and uh, it turned out really good. And Phil was into it and everyone else was into it. So we're going to keep doing stuff. Excellent. Well, I know I would yeah. certainly be, uh, be happy to see you guys perform, as a lot of people would. So you hope to see that happen. That'd be sick. Excellent. Anything else you'd like to share, man? Uh, this um, uh, it's open mic. You know, if there's anything you'd like open to open mic. <laughs> yeah, just... uh, Baba Booey, hit him with a hind. Uh, <laughs> Howard Stern. You know. Yeah, whatever um, your uh, your favorite karaoke jam is, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like to. I like to. I like to, say, I'd like to make a plea to take out all of, to edit out all of my ums and my rants. <laughs> Please. The ums, I think, are just human nature at this point, and rants. Okay. I think you're good. I don't. I don't. I didn't. I don't Turn think. I think brain. this is relatively rant free. So I think you're all good. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Well, yeah. I. I don't really. Yeah. I mean, just my any uh, shows my, or uh, anything on the anything, horizon, or I would say, yeah, if we're talking, we're talking plugs here. We're doing the plugs. I would say, uh, anyone who's listening and likes the record, you know send it to a friend, send it to, you think someone who would, might like it. And, uh, you know, I don't care if it's, if you don't, you can buy it or you can not buy it. You could send the legal MP3s, whatever, just spread, spread the word. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> right. On. Um, yeah, it's, it's all good. If you do want to buy it, you can get it from relapse somewhere on like the band camp or something. I don't know, but, <laughs> 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 but, and uh, also check out Eternal Champion, our, our other band, our other projects. Three, I think, yeah, two members of Summerlands right now. And uh, it's just like more classic, uh, epic metal. Excellent. Excellent. And, and Manila Road. And you guys can find me on uh, Instagram with the handle Dehumanizer. Sounds good. Like man. the Black Sabbath record. I was going to say, about. like your favorite Sabbath record. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, Arthur, man, thank you so much for taking the time. You're uh, a busy dude. Thanks, so, dude. yeah. I, I, uh, I appreciate you guys uh, and, and reaching out and for the good words about the record. Definitely. Well, it, it really is a killer album, man. And uh, everyone out there in uh, podcast land, go check out Summerlands. Go check out all of Arthur's work and his other projects. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, man, just keep kicking ass out there, man. It's 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 great what you're doing. All right, man. Thank you, brother. Take it easy. Yeah, you just... uh, don't don't be afraid to hit me up after this. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. Definitely, we'll be in touch. I'd like yeah. to check out, like to check out your band. Yeah, sounds like we got a lot of uh, a lot of common threads. So yeah, we'll talk, man. Take it easy, man. Yeah, you do the same, brother. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right, that's it. Another epic episode of Ascending the Holy Mountain is coming to a close. Huge thanks to Holy Mountain Printing for making this a possibility, as well as Slasher Film Festival strategy for the theme song. Also, just another reminder, we have six shows that air Monday through Sunday on our network. Be sure to head over to lastchancepodcastnetwork.com, learn more about them, and subscribe to them on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. So until next time, you guys stay safe out there.
This has been a Last Chance Podcast production brought to you by the Last Chance Podcast Network.